do we define success? I was struck when Tyler sent me that, that topic because it takes up a lot of discussion amongst, I know for my leadership team, other ministry leaders that I know in other churches, like how, how do we even use that word success? How do we define biblical success? And to address that, I'm going to speak very broadly about ministry. I, I suppose if I'm defining success as faithfulness and I was talking to a room full of preachers, I would be very, very, very specific in what I think faithfulness entails in preaching. I'm going to keep it fairly broad, but the principles are the same. And to do that, turn to Colossians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 2 through 6, but I really want to ver- focus on verse 17. So I'm going to read Colossians 4, 2 through 6, and verse 17. Paul the Apostle says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, And that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. And verse 17. And tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Let me just pray for us once more. Father, we desperately want to be faithful. And so we're asking tonight that you would remind us, encourage us, and guide us into what it means to be faithful to you in our ministry in our homes, in our relationships, in every way, that we might reflect the true and faithful one to this world. Spirit of God, would you just speak to us all collectively and also prophetically and individually as you point us to Christ. We ask in his name. Amen. William Carey, who has been often referred to as the father of modern mission, once said, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of succeeding in things that don't matter. (laughs) That's always stuck with me. Because it's very easy to define success as just doing a good job or having a perhaps impressive result. But at the end of the day, we're asking, does it really matter? How do we know? Well, Paul, of course, in the passage we read in verse 2 through 6, describes what I believe is a pattern of faithful ministry. But I, I actually want to draw your attention to verse 17 because, of course, Paul's writing this letter to the Colossian church and As he often does in his letters, he'll call out and address or affirm different members of the congregation. At times, it's an acknowledgement of their work. But here at the end of Colossians, you've seen this before. Maybe you've heard talks on it. I love it. There's this charge to a man named Archippus. Or more accurately, it's a charge that the church was supposed to give to Archippus. Just imagine for a moment, you are in attendance next Sunday, you know, and you're not doing youth ministry. Let's say you're in the the major gathering. You know where I'm going with this. And it comes time for the Apostle Paul's teaching. 
and his letter to be read in the gathering, and all of a sudden, your name out of everyone's is mentioned directly. <laughs> I mean, you would like sit up. You know, if you just start fading, and you're just like, okay, this is not a bad sermon, like six out of ten. All of a sudden, Tim Chaddock, fulfill your ministry. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. I think it's a verse that raises vital questions for us to, to ask about our ministry and how we define success. So I just want to give you three charges from this verse and then try to get really practical about what it means. Now, the word success, as I said, is, is tricky. I think all of us would agree that we ultimately define success in ministry as faithfulness. So I'm just going to use the word faithful. And I'd like to just charge you tonight with these three things. Faithfulness is fulfilling your ministry from the Lord, for the Lord, and with the Lord. So the three charges, but it gets really practical. So first, what does it mean for you and I to be faithful in ministry? First, faithfulness means receiving your ministry from the Lord. When Paul uses the word ministry here, and notice he does use it, our cheapest, fulfill your what? Your ministry. It is not so much an office he refers to, but a particular responsibility. And it is a reminder to every one of us that we have a responsibility, but it comes to us from the Lord. Paul makes it absolutely clear what, or more importantly, who guides this ministry. He receives his direction from the Lord. Here's why that's important and what it has to do with faithfulness and how we might define success. More broadly speaking, our temptation is to forget this and live our lives and do our ministries as though it were by our will and not by his will, by what we want to see rather than what he wants to see. Our own dislikes, comforts, or avoiding discomfort, or other people's opinions. But if you base your definition of success on comfort, likes or dislikes, other people's opinions, then you will not be faithful. And thus your ministry will not be a success. And that's why the topic of call is so important. And I'm glad we addressed it earlier this afternoon. And of course, as we saw in Acts 13, the practice of prayer. It begins here. God, is the ministry that I'm doing something that has come from you? Or has it come from man? Has it come from my own preferences or from the pressures that I'm facing? And this is why prayer is so vital. I was speaking with Tyler earlier. Um, some of you don't know that much about my little um, church network, but it's called Reality. There's nine churches, started 20 years ago. And one of the defining marks of reality started when I planted out of the very first church, which was called Reality Carpinteria, and we planted Reality LA. The senior pastor there was a man named Britt Merrick in Carpinteria, and we had been having conversations about whether or not I was going to plant a church. At the time, I was working at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, and my wife and I were prayerfully discerning if we were indeed called to plant a church, and if so, what did that mean? What did faithfulness look like? What did success look like? When I met with Britt to talk about planting with his church, he first of all asked me where I wanted to plant. I said, San Francisco. And he waved his little hand like a Jedi mind trick maybe, like this, and he said, what about L.A.? I said, I hate L.A. And he said, just pray. <laughs> I was like, oh, whatever, I hate L.A. So I'm like, oh, I guess we got to pray. So I go tell my wife, I'm like, okay, well, I guess we need to pray, but we're still going to SF because that's where I want to go. And over the course of eight months, God changed our hearts as we really began to pray. 
we felt prompted to go up and spend some time in L.A., and as we were there, just throughout the whole course of that time, God made it so clear that he was indeed calling us there. Like, oh my gosh, God's shifted me away from my preference, and through prayer, he's made it very clear what his priority is. So then, at the end of eight months, I call up Britt, and I say, okay, L.A. is on. When do we move to L.A.? He said, you're not going to move to L.A. You're going to move to Carpinteria. I said, I hate Carpinteria. <laughs> he said, here's, I said, why? Like, let's just go. We're just going to, I'm going to start a Bible study. Boom, it's going to happen. He said, no. You're going to move to Carpinteria for one year. And I said, that seems like a waste of time. And he said, it's because we're going to spend a year doing nothing but praying. And everything in my own flesh was like, oh, kind of a waste of time, but sure. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll pray. How foolish I was. That was a very practical and transformative way that we ensured that this ministry was indeed from the Lord and not just from my own impulse or will. One of the best ways to practice this is through prayer. And so we did. We did a year of prayer meetings, and that began what for us was a very key value in our reality family of churches that we're never going to plant a church unless we've absolutely paved the way in prayer. Because oftentimes in our own lives, prayer is assumed it's not practiced. I was excited when I saw the list of workshops. All of them look excellent, but I was excited particularly about Nate Holdridge's uh, one on prayer. How to organize your prayer life, is that what it is? Oh, like we must not just assume prayer, we must practice prayer because faithfulness begins on our knees before the Lord. God, is this indeed what you are calling me to do? And here's, here's why this is so important. If you are not prayerfully discerning that this ministry is indeed from the Lord, like Paul told our cheapest, then very often it comes down to preference or pressure. On the one hand, some of us choose ministries. We have an ideal of ministry. We have a preference. Oh, I like what they do. You know, Tyler mentioned comparing yourself to other ministries. Oh, I like what they do. I want to do that. Okay, that's cool. But maybe that's not what God is calling you to do. Or maybe it will look differently than that. This can't merely be based on preference. Alternatively, we end up doing ministry based on pressure. This is the worst. Britt, who not only started our little church movement, he's also my best friend, but he would always tell me, he's like, look, we never want to be merely need-driven, but call-driven. Because there's need everywhere. But how do I know that I'm called to meet that need? If you read the gospel according to John, we see a very beautiful picture of Jesus doing what the Father wants him to do. When you read the Gospel of Mark, he goes away and he prays and all the sick and demonized are brought and Peter finds Jesus. Where were you? There's all these people in need. And Jesus says, we're going to the next, next town for this reason I have come. Jesus models perfectly for us fulfilling ministry from the Lord. Pressure-driven Ministry, if you define success by there was a pressure and I handled it, like that's not good for anyone. People will come to you, you guys do youth ministry, like, you know, I, I did just full disclosure, I only did youth ministry for a year and I couldn't handle it. So I have all the respect for you in the world. And you know what was the worst for me? It was the parents. Can we talk about this? No, I'm not, I'm not going to. Oh, my goodness. I remember, like, dealing with all this, like, sin and drama and the youth. And, you know, the parents are like, he's a good boy. I'm like, he was doing crack in the parking lot. She's like, he's a good boy. <laughs> he was not doing. Yes, he was. I'm like, oh, my God. I, I can't deal with this. Put me in L.A. with, like, 25-year-olds. At least they have, like, legal agency. And I can tell them they're being stupid without worrying about their mom. Anyway, so I, I commend you guys. God bless you. But it's so easy to be moved just by pressure. Like, we've got a problem, or we've got this, or we've got this need. And I'm not saying you ignore those, but rather the pressures should become a prompt to prayer. 
Because it may be that Jesus says, yeah, I don't want you to respond to that. Or if you do respond to that, here's how you're going to do it. You're going to do it my way. Because faithfulness means receiving your ministry from the Lord. What is God calling you to do? Now, in that, I'm not saying that results don't matter. I just want to talk about this for a brief moment. Because we think about it all the time. Like, what do we do with results? How do we define results? And what kind of results matter? So don't misunderstand me. Sometimes results can reveal important things. For example, if you put on a, a youth event and nobody comes, and you're like, the result was not good. Nobody was here. And it turns out, that that bad result revealed that you didn't put the address on the little card? <laughs> sure, you learned something that day. Like, next time, let's put the address on there. That's good. That's good. But on the other hand, just because you have a packed room and just because the communicator was excellent does not, according to the Bible, mean it was a success. Was Christ faithfully preached? Was the word faithfully expounded? Are we seeing the results as the Bible defines the results we should be looking for, which we call fruit? How do we define this? It comes from the Lord. He sets the agenda. He determines faithfulness. I don't know who needs to hear this, but listen. In ministry, results may vary. <laughs> you know when you go buy something from like CVS or whatever for your like, you know, your rash or whatever, it's like results may vary. It's like, well. <laughs> just like a, just a crude way of saying like if you start a, a new ministry, like all of you are in different church sizes and you have different size youth groups and some of you are like junior high and high school combined and, and then maybe you go look at another church like, oh, they have a junior high on one night and a high school on another night. Look, look what they, and should I compare theirs to, to my, look, results may vary. You need to be faithful. You need to be faithful, ensuring that what you're doing is received from the Lord. Paul told our cheapest, Fulfill your ministry from who? The Lord. But then you need to carry it out, which leads to the second point. Faithfulness means fulfilling your ministry for the Lord. So first, successful ministry means that it's coming from the Lord, that he's directing it, not your preferences or the pressures that people put on you. But secondly, we need to carry it out. We need to see it through. That's what Paul is telling our cheapest. Paul wanted this man, and we ver know very little about him. Paul wanted him to be strengthened and encouraged. But notice, he didn't make this appeal privately, but publicly. Why? Why? Why did he need to hear this? Was our cheapest tempted to give up? What if our cheapest did youth ministry in Colossae? <laughs> Maybe he was tempted to give up. He's like, I got the PS5, and it's like, it didn't work. Like, what do I do? <laughs> Maybe he was tempted to give up. Maybe he was tempted to go to another church when God wasn't calling him. Maybe people didn't like him as much as he wanted. Maybe he wasn't getting enough praise from his boss. Uh-oh. <laughs> or maybe he was being lazy. Maybe he had become disconnected. Maybe he became jaded. Or perhaps he was discouraged. Or like many of us, exhausted. Listen, we don't know the reason why he needed to hear this, but we can be sure that the Holy Spirit meant for him to hear it. And reading it publicly would emphasize how important it was that Archippus fulfilled his ministry that he received from the Lord to then see it through for the Lord. And just as he needed to hear this encouragement, 
so do we. Practically, it meant that he was to take up that ministry. Okay, here's what the Lord's calling me to do. I'm receiving this from the Lord. He's made it clear, as we talked about earlier, from the clarity of God's word, the prompting of God's spirit, and the affirmation of God's people. I've got my marching orders. I then need to be faithful to carry it out. That's how we define success. One of the reasons we try to put so much prayer into our decision making is because I know for me, I'm constantly reminded that my purpose is to be faithful to God. And we all know that your ministry faithfulness is really tested when things are not going the way that you'd hoped. When things are difficult or there's opposition. It's being faithful in any and every season until God changes direction. See it through. And unless God has made it clear that your current ministry is fulfilled, you are called to be faithful to continue to fulfill your ministry. Through tough seasons, through good seasons, and even through transition seasons, you must see it through. You have a ministry. See, Here's what happens, especially when we work in churches. Maybe there's a little bit of friction between you and the pastoral staff. Maybe what's going on in the church is a very difficult season. Sometimes we interpret that immediately as like, well, this is hard, or like, this particular situation is difficult for me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw away from this ministry. But listen, unless the Lord Jesus Christ himself is drawing you away from that, you've got to be faithful. Because ultimately, it's from the Lord, and it must be fulfilled not for your senior pastor. Notice it doesn't say, our cheapest, fulfill your ministry for your boss. It's the Lord. There are several seasons in the last 20 years for me where I wanted desperately to give up. Some of them were related to the ministry itself, what was going on in the church. And in more recent years, it was what was going on in my family. As I shared earlier, we moved to London, we planted the church there, and everything was, from a church perspective, was going so well. It was so fruitful. And then halfway through our time in London, my family began to suffer. Particularly two of my children. And that began a season of two years of wrestling with this tension of, Lord, we believe you called us here. And we're seeing fruit in the ministry, but my family is suffering. And it was very important in that moment not to make a knee-jerk reaction about what we should do, but commit it to prayer. And that began two years of praying, my wife and I praying with, with other leaders and discerning. First, from the clarity of God's word, the prompting of God's spirit, and the affirmation of God's people, that my first ministry is what? Under Jesus Christ, it's to my wife and my kids. And that I needed to make a decision that would put them in the best place of fruitfulness for them. That's what we discerned. I had to discern through that with a lot of other leaders and and my wife. And so we made the decision. We think God's calling us back. But then how do I transition the church? I couldn't just peace out. I had to be faithful, having discerned that God was calling us back to care for my family. I didn't just tell my leadership team, hey guys, I'm out, figure it out. I had to be faithful to pass the baton. And that was right when COVID hit and we all have our COVID stories and crazy and terrible and awesome and all the things. But I had to be faithful. 
I had to be faithful to pass the baton. And even though I knew that I was going somewhere else, going back to California, when it would have been very easy just to check out or not put as much effort into my sermons, knowing that I was going to leave, knowing that I wasn't going to be pastoring these people, you know, for the years to come, but I was leaving soon, I still had to be faithful to feed the sheep and to care for the flock and to care for my family in the meantime until that baton was passed. And once it was passed, I could then step away. Friends, your ministry faithfulness will be tested time and time again. And the way in which we define success should be faithfulness. And that key word there in the passage is fulfill, or the NIV says complete. Complete the ministry. Don't cut corners. Don't give up. Fulfill your ministry for the Lord. I want to encourage you because I sense that some of you are discouraged right now because you're looking at certain results and you're wondering what to do with that. And I just want to say to you that if God has called you and placed you where you are, then your presence matters. And you have a ministry from Christ that must be fulfilled. And therefore, I pray that this weekend would be a time where you are encouraged to carry it out. And if you do that by the power of the Holy Spirit, regardless of some of how the results go, we would say that is a success. I just got back from the UK. We had taken a huge team from that. We took 75 people to the UK. 40 of them were teenagers. It was, I don't know if that's a good idea, but it was awesome. Part of what we did after we served at this festival is we did a church history tour in central London. And the last church that our guide took us to, a great pastor in central London, he guided us on this whole tour. He took us to the church that John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, pastored for 27 years. So we're in John Newton's church, and, you know, all the Californians are like, oh, my gosh, Amazing Grace is here. <laughs> you know, like, everyone's just, like, loving this, like, church history tour, Right. Everyone knows the song, famous, you know, there's, the, there's the, these huge banners with images on there descri describing the history of the abolition of the slave trade. You know, it's just so moving and compelling. So he tells us the whole story, we're reminded, and we read scripture and we pray. But right before he sent us out, the church history tour concluded in that moment in John Newton's church. He said, here's one thing I want to leave you with. As we've talked about the legacy that God produced through John Newton, one thing I want to leave you with. Look around at the size of this room. And when you're in that church and you look around the room, it's tiny. And at first you're like, what a strange thing to say. But he had a point. He said, what if John Newton only defined success as how big his church was? he would have become greatly discouraged. This is a small, it's, a, it's not, you guys are, this crowd right here is bigger than what could fit in that chapel. But he said that's not how he defined success. It was faithfulness to the one who saved him and fulfilling his ministry. That really struck me. Charles Spurgeon Right? Quote him again. I mean, why not? We're here. Let's hear from Spurgeon. But I'll never forget when I, one of the first books I read from Spurgeon was All Around Ministry. And from that book, he says this on your responsibility to be faithful. He said, if I am a sentinel set to guard the army at a certain point, I know that every post in the whole cordon, line of soldiers, is important. But I'm not to dream that mine is not so. If so, I may be inclined to sleep, and the foe may surprise the camp at the point which I ought to have guarded. I am to feel as if the whole safety of the entire camp depended on me. At least I ought to be as zealous and as watchful if it were so. You see the links of that chain? Each one of them has a certain strain upon it. Suppose one of them should say, I may rest through. It does not matter, for the other links are strong. No, my friend, 
The chain depends on each link. And so, for the completeness of church work and for the perfect edification of the body of Christ, a great weight of responsibility lies on you. No pressure, but a little bit. (laughs) You must fulfill your ministry for the Lord. You have a ministry to the youth you are serving now, if indeed Christ has called you. And that means your number one concern, the way that you define success is first and foremost, I must be faithful. And that means uncertainty, challenge, and transition changes none of that. It might prompt you to pray like it did for me and my family in a time of great need. But until it's clear that the Lord has changed your marching orders, you must be faithful. Circumstances may make it easier or harder. But until you have fulfilled the ministry that Christ has given you, you must be faithful to carry it out for the Lord. And when Jesus gives you a new ministry and calls you to a new season that is prayerfully discerned, then you take that step and you be faithful. That's how we define success. I would also add we need to encourage one another in this. Just as the church was called to encourage our cheapest, so you are to call your leaders and your youth and your staff to fulfill their ministry. Otherwise, we will be driven by pressures and preferences. But maybe like our cheapest, some of us are tired or maybe discouraged or maybe disconnected. Maybe some of us have grown indifferent. I've had to battle all of those in my own life. I'm currently battling some of that right now to be transparent. And I'm in need of this encouragement. But whatever state your heart is in, we all must take this charge to heart. Fulfill your ministry. That is the ultimate definition of success. Because if Christ has called you to it, it means you are uniquely gifted for it. And his grace will be sufficient in your weakness. And that's why your difficulty, your challenge, is an opportunity to lead, lean into Christ more than you ever have before. And that's the last way that I define ministry success. Faithfulness means fulfilling your ministry with the Lord. This is huge. Did you notice how Paul phrased it? He said, Fulfill your ministry in the Lord. What a strange way to say it. Like it comes from the Lord. It's clear that it's to be for the Lord. But the word he uses is in the Lord. Or quite literally, with the Lord. For by saying in the Lord, he reminds us of our source and our center. That before we do anything for God, it's about being with God. One of the key phrases that has shaped the last 20 years of my life and ministry is this. And if you remember nothing else, remember this. All ministry flows from intimacy. All ministry for the Lord flows from intimacy with the Lord. That's how he's designed it. Ultimately, biblical success is, were you with Jesus? Because that's where the power comes from. How we define success is being with Jesus because that's the only only way you become like Jesus. All ministry for the Lord flows from intimacy with Jesus the Lord. We must be near him. We must become like him. How often, friends, does ministry actually come in place of intimacy? We no longer spend our time or mornings in prayer and reading 
the word of God to, to shape us. We're like looking for the next talk we're going to do. Or like I shared earlier, my prayers are so often driven for the right decision to make for the ministry when I'm not asking him to make me more like him. And what a tragedy that is. Because let me tell you, I have seen over the years, and but for the grace of God, we would all go in this direction. I have known specific people. I'm now like a fully middle-aged, right? So I'm, you know, I'm not like the sage, just like halfway. But I've been doing this long enough to see some friends that I've had where for years there appeared to be great success in their ministry, meaning numbers, dynamic, and even, as far as I could tell, some discernible fruit. And I'm thinking of one person in particular. They ended up having a horrible affair, which is tragic. But then what resulted from the fallout of that affair is he confessed that he had been distant from the Lord for years. Because we all know that those types of decisions, they never happen overnight. You don't wake up in the morning and say, yeah, I'm going to cheat on my spouse, throw away the ministry, walk away from Jesus. This had been a long time coming. Now, what did that do to all the people who had been a part of that ministry? It made them question it all. So even the apparent success, they then were questioning all of that. Because like, wait a minute. This guy wasn't even like walking with Jesus for at least a huge portion of that. Friends, when I say that biblical success is ultimately defined by being with the Lord, that's not just some like little thing we're supposed to say at a youth leaders conference. This is the heart and soul of ministry. In Mark chapter 3, when Jesus first called the disciples, you remember that? Jesus begins his public ministry and then he, he goes up on the mountain and he prays and chooses the disciples that he wanted. Oh, if you, read it tonight before you go to bed. Mark 3, here's what it says. He chose those he wanted first to be with him and then he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Do you see the priority? He chose first those he wanted to be with him. And then from that place, he sent them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. When the risen Jesus met with his disciples and said, all authority has been given to me. And he commissions them. What does he say at the very end? And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When the Holy Spirit sends you into ministry, he sends you with himself. You don't go away from God. Oftentimes in ministry, we're like, we're like a car where you go to the service station and you fuel up and then you go away and you're like, all right, got what I need. Now I'm going to go away and when I run on empty, I'll come back to you. That's a terrible way to do ministry. That's not successful and that's not faithful regardless of what the results look like. A better example would be like the trains in London. They run on the third rail. You know what I'm talking about? The electric rail, meaning that they always have to be connected to get their power to go where they're going to go. Don't be like the car where you just fuel up and then you go and you like burn out and then you come back and you come to a conference to kind of get filled up and then you walk away from him again. Be like that train on the third rail, always connected because faithfulness is ultimately about fulfilling your ministry with the Lord. And I emphasize that tonight because as hard as it may seem given our modern metrics of success, and we do want people to meet Jesus. Well, it'd be great if a room is packed full of young people coming to Christ. Like, that's amazing. The book of Acts talks about that. But the primary way that we're called to go about ministry is we leave the results to God. Remember Paul said, I planted, he watered, but who gave the increase? God gave the increase. It's about receiving from the Lord, 
fulfilling it for the Lord and being with the Lord. All ministry flows from intimacy. And it is this nearness to him that first and foremost should define success for us. Because he is our sure foundation who enables us to flourish anywhere and endure anything. Because listen, friends, you are not your ministry. Your core identity is not your ministry. And there's a great temptation to like view your identity through the lens of ministry. And I went through a minor identity crisis when I was leaving Reality Lay because for 10 years, like by the grace of God, we saw all these people getting saved. It was like crazy. It was wild. And then God's like, move to London. I'm like, okay. And I was wrestling with that because like, People are like, you're leaving a successful church. And I was like, I ain't, what? What am I doing? And I was meeting with this Christian counselor, and he's asking me to talk about, Tim, tell me how you're, like, processing leaving Reality Lay and, like, moving to a city you've never lived before and starting from scratch. And my daughter every night was like, Dad, what if we move and, like, nobody comes and we run out of funding and, like, the church doesn't happen. We don't get legal status. You don't get your visa. And I was like, yeah, those are all my worst fears. Thank you, honey. Thank you for articulating it in such a way that I couldn't do it myself. Thank you. <laughs> you just enlivened my prayer life. <laughs> so I'm talking with this counselor, and, you know, I'm talking about my identity issues and reality lay, because in so many ways my identity was bound up in this church that I had planted and pastored. And he just said this simple phrase to me. He said, Tim, the way you've been talking about it is that Tim Chaddock has a story, and reality lay was a part of it. But it should be, God has a story for Reality LA, and you got to be a part of it. It was like such a simple shift, but for me, it was profound. I was viewing it all through the lens of my own identity. Like, what I did, look what I did. It's like, he's like, no, God does his thing. Kingdom, you know, like church, capital C, it's his. And guess what? You got to be a part of it for a little while. And I was reminded later by a friend, famous quote by a name that you'll never forget, Count von Zinzendorf. <laughs> okay, laugh at the name, but his quote is fire. Preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. <laughs> How good is that? Preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. Because you are not your ministry. You are a child of God. You are adopted, you are accepted, you are beloved. And when you die and Jesus welcomes you in by grace, he will not say, well done, my good and successful servant. He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Biblical success is fulfilling your ministry from the Lord. He sets the direction. It's for the Lord. You are called to take up that responsibility and go for it with all the power of the Holy Spirit and his gifting, but you must do it with the Lord because if we're not drawing near to him, if we're not drawing our leaders near to him, then even though there might be some results on the surface, it's only a matter of time before that turns out to paper over the cracks. We must view faithfulness and success as being with Jesus. And tonight we have an opportunity to draw near and just reset our priorities. I'm just going to ask you to bow your, your heads. The team's going to come up and we're going to have a time where we can respond. And as we were worshiping earlier, there's just two questions that I sensed might be good for us to ask. Where have we valued results over relationship? Where have we been valuing results over our relationship with Christ? And where have we been led by just preferences and pressures rather than the prompting of God? just sense that God really wants to speak in to those areas. And we're going to pray and we're going to ask him to do that. And we would do well to respond to him 
and not just play the ministry game or put on the mask or just busy ourselves, but draw near to him. Father, we confess if in any way we've defined biblical success as mere results or being driven by our own preferences or the pressures that others put on us. And we're just asking that you would recalibrate us tonight. That our chief concern would be nearness to you. And like our chief has heard that day, that we would hear today that we must fulfill our ministry in you, with you, from you, for you. It's all about you. Our identity is not in our ministry so that if you move us on or we transition or it doesn't look the same as it did or if it grows or if it shrinks, we don't lose any of our core identity because we are hidden in Christ. So I pray that you'd renew us as we draw near to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.